Train stop? It stopped, didn't it? Yeah. What happened? Ah, oh, it's jammed. When the Combine shut down the quarantine zone, they must have tightened security. Which means? Yeah, you're nowhere near Fairview Junction. You're just outside the QZ. And this is as far as we get by train. Then I'm headed on foot. Good. I'll see if I can get you in some other way. a dead zombie here. I, I thought the Combine sealed up the QZ. Oh, this one must have squirted out. I've heard they've had trouble with barnacle spores outside the containment area, but not about fellas like this. Probably not a one-off then. I doubt it. Even in our earliest experiments in bringing Half-Life to VR, we found that players enjoyed exploring every nook and cranny of the environment. With the increased fidelity of VR, players not only expected to be able to interact with a vast array of objects, but they also had a strong desire to find something useful from time to time. This was so universal among testers that in addition to more searchable locations and interactive objects, we added a new resource, Resin. Level designers could place this new resource in fun and interesting locations that weren't tied to game progression, rewarding players wider ranging exploration. We also tied this new resource to a longer term goal in the form of weapon upgrades, further motivating players to explore the environment. Deep scavenger hunts and keen observation would result in more resin to spend as a reward. Internally, we refer to this type of puzzle as a toner puzzle, due to its similarity to a real-world cable toner tool that can be used to locate electrical wires in walls. The toner mechanic was conceived as a tool for designers to craft player experiences around knowing that the player had to put their head and hands in specific locations. The initial design merely required the player to use their multi-tool to push a ball of energy along a path, similar to a child's bead maze toy. While this simple design was successful at getting the player to put their head and hands in particular locations, the lack of branching meant that the player wasn't required to make any choices, nor was there any possibility of negative consequences. To address these issues, we added the rotating junction elements, which allowed for branching paths and became the player's primary means of interacting with toner puzzles. While the toner puzzles ramp up in complexity throughout the game, this first toner puzzle is designed to use a minimal number of elements to introduce players to the key ideas that power flows through wires, power can be rerouted by rotating junctions, and power has an effect on the physical world, such as turning on lights and opening gates. The sparking electrical outlet that branches down toward the floor is not strictly necessary for this simple puzzle, but it was added here to expose players to its behavior, since it was causing confusion in later puzzles when players were seeing it for the first time in more complex configurations. From our earliest experiments in VR, we realized how critical high-quality, high-density lighting was to conveying a sense of realism. In game development, any technology choice involves trade-offs between quality, runtime performance, oh, and development time. Alex. For Half-Life Alex, we chose a high-quality, high-performance light mapping solution, which required a significant amount of offline pre-processing. We performed the light map pre-processing using a render form, which could take several hours for a single map at the highest quality. And we put a lot of effort into mitigating the cost of that high iteration time for designers on the team. Specifically, we implemented a real-time approximation to the final lighting result, which allowed designers to light scenes in real time with confidence that the high performance light maps would match their intent. Most lights in Half-Life Alex are baked into a single term that describes distance fall off and shadow, allowing us to change the brightness and color of lights in real time at no cost. This encoding also allows us to apply shadows from dynamic props and characters, 
without having to render any static geometry into shadow maps. Our light maps store directional information using the popular ambient highlight direction encoding, an improvement over valve zone radiosity normal mapping technique pioneered in Half-Life 2. This new light map encoding ensures that the bumpy surfaces can appear bumpy even when not under direct light. This blinking light source provides a good illustration of this technique, as you can perceive the surface detail even during times the light source is off. Barnacles, while an iconic half-life creature, presented some interesting VR-specific challenges. While their tongue is intended to trap hasty or unobservant players, those caught by them often didn't realize what was happening. They would become disoriented or even motion sick as the barnacle lifted them up to be eaten. These unfortunate players almost universally died and failed to learn what was happening even after multiple encounters. To address this issue, we created the tongue as a particle system. This allowed us to both physically simulate it as well as reliably position it for maximum visibility. If a player does get grabbed by a barnacle, the tongue always wraps right in front of their face, no matter which direction they try to look. This makes the tongue almost impossible to miss and visually guides the player's eyes up to the location of the barnacle so they know where to shoot to free themselves. These fixation visuals that kick in as the player is being lifted not only serve to communicate the damage the player is taking, but they also help to reduce motion sickness by narrowing the player's field of view. These changes, combined with sound effects and other visuals like seeing stars and blacking out, eliminate confusion for players and enable us to bring this classic enemy into the world of Half-Life Alex. We got a lot of positive feedback from our initial experiments requiring players to perform a series of physical actions to reload the pistol. Specifically, ejecting the clip, retrieving a new clip from their backpack, inserting the clip into the gun, and chambering around. Players enjoyed learning and improving at this skill. We experimented with using a single button for both ejecting a clip and chambering around, but we found that assigning these operations to two different buttons was more interesting even though it was more mentally taxing. In fact, it was more interesting precisely because it was more mentally taxing, as players would frequently mix up the buttons under pressure. In the early stages of the game, players would be fumbling for clips, ejecting the clips when they meant to be chambering around, and generally making a mess. To those of us observing the playtest, this looked like things had gone horribly wrong, but players themselves consistently cited this as a high point of their playthroughs. Because of the physical nature of the reload, and the skill required, players blamed themselves and not the game for the mistakes made as they were learning the reloading sequence. In this area, we provide a number of static targets in the form of barnacles for players to shoot at their own pace, increasing the likelihood that they have at least a few reloads under their belt before moving on. Just looking, Russ. Take it the quarantine zone is behind this hatch? Yeah, yeah, that's where they keep it. I'll look around for a control panel to open it up.
in prior Half-Life games, while playing as Gordon, the player saw Alex use her multi-tool to hack into Combine security systems in order to unlock doors or perform other acts of sabotage. This presented an opportunity for us to represent Alex's hacking skills through VR-centric minigames. All of our hacking minigame designs were built to leverage the independently tracked head and hands common to today's VR systems. We wanted to encourage players to use both hands simultaneously and move their head to create parallax to understand the spatial relationships within the puzzles. This locker hacking puzzle is based upon one of our earliest prototypes, in which the player was tasked with using a tool in one hand to paint a path on a sphere held by the other hand. There was just something fun and unique about using all of the natural degrees of freedom of both hands to solve a puzzle in VR. In its simplest form, this puzzle's solution is straightforward. But the difficulty gradually increases throughout the course of the game by introducing static or moving obstacles of various shapes and sizes on the screen. How far is Fairview Junction? You'll go through the old subway tunnels on your way to the train yard. Have they started moving Dad yet? I don't think so, which is good news because we've still got time. Oh, that's great. Or bad news because they've already killed him. And you don't need to move a corpse, you just bury it. Or burn it. Still there, Alex? Mm-hmm. Russell, are you seeing this? Wow. All right. Here we go. In our early prototypes, players could heal themselves by grabbing a Half-Life 2 health pack and pressing down on a controller button, hey, which obviously wasn't a very interesting VR interaction. During the development of Half-Life Alex, the Counter-Strike team added health injectors into CSGO as part of the new Danger Zone game mode they were developing. When we saw this, we felt that an injector would work well as an intuitive healing item in VR as well. Players would press a button to arm the injector as a way of indicating their intent to use it, this prevented unintentional use of the injector and gave us an opportunity to showcase how physical the interaction was going to be via haptics, animation, and sound. Some testers even initially responded with dread over the fact they were going to have to use a needle on themselves and looked away when performing the injection oh action. We also had to create approximations of the player's arms and body as playtesters all had their own preferences for where they wanted to apply the injection. We even added the ability to inject into the head since so many players tried to do it just to see if it would work. We had to ensure that players would become proficient at reloading their pistol during the early levels of the game or later encounters in the game would be overly difficult. The prior map contained only static targets in the form of barnacles. Players could engage the barnacles at their own pace but there were enough of them that players would need to reload at least a few times. This first live zombie is locked behind the chain link fence and cannot reach the player until the player opts into the encounter by shooting the lock on the door. The placement of zombies in the upcoming section of the game is designed to require plenty of reloading to ensure that the player builds up this skill. Oh, just so you know, the Russells have a built-in display shows your resin, ammo, you know, it might come in handy. Got it. Thanks. Virtual reality provides the opportunity to add physicality to gameplay, but this needs to be balanced against player fatigue and accessibility. For example, we experimented with a low ceiling in this area, 
requiring players to crouch the whole time that they made their way across the tops of these train cars. Playtesters did not enjoy having to crouch for so long, so we raised the ceiling. glass panels in Half-Life Alex are yet one more system designed to convince players that they are present in a living, breathing world. The panels detect the position of an incoming impact and procedurally generate new, smaller glass panels in a radial pattern around the impact position. These new panels can then break into smaller panels themselves, and so on. We found that players would often break glass panels accidentally, then spend time testing just how interactive they really were by trying to break them more eventually realizing that yes, the glass really did shatter at the appropriate location. At one point, we experimented with building special puzzles out of breakable glass, but in the end we found the glass to be more appropriate as a passive interactive element in the world, one that reacts in a satisfying way to a variety of impacts, from zombie melee attacks to incoming gunfire or any other physical interaction in the game. Weapon upgrades are a new feature for the Half-Life franchise, and fictionally this mechanic paired well with Alex's tinkering nature. We approached this design challenge first by thinking about what sort of upgrades could be meaningful and also provide additional value to players without removing established interactions. With limited resin to spend, the upgrade system also provided an avenue for players to personalize and invest in their favorite weapon, or streamline an interaction on another weapon increasing its value to them. For example, the reflex sight still requires players to physically aim, but it improves the feedback on exactly where their shot will hit, and exposes previously hidden enemy weak points. While some players enjoyed this feedback and new targeting opportunities, others didn't and would instead focus on upgrades that suited their style of play. This allowed players to spend their limited resin on upgrades they cared about the most. Another aspect of weapon upgrades that we focused on was not necessarily obvious when we first started to design and test combat in VR. Due to the more physical nature of combat in VR, it can really push on the mental and physical capacity of certain players, as they're required to utilize both their hands and move their head to take in the environment dealing with enemies. While this is a very natural experience, there's also a lot going on at any given point with reloading and combat. As we observed players in some of these more intense combat situations, we started finding opportunities to allow some upgrades to reduce the number of times a physical interaction was required, or reduce the complexity of a particular interaction. The autoloader on the shotgun is a good example. When added to the shotgun, the normally slow, methodical action of feeding shells into the gun is replaced with a far simpler, faster interaction of slapping the shells into the autoloader before they get automatically fed into the gun. This allows players to look around, focus less on the gun while reloading, and take in more of what's going on around them. At the beginning of the Half-Life Alex project, we had the expectation that players would want to take a break after 30 to 45 minutes since that's what we were seeing with the lab and other small-scale VR experiences available at the time. Because of this, we designed the pacing of the game's levels around play sessions of that duration. 
Over the course of development, however, the game itself included more downtime between intense combat encounters, and the comfort of the new crop of HMDs improved significantly. In fact, as the game progressed, we found that players were happy to play for hours on end. At the end of a playtest, players would often remark that this was the longest they had ever played VR in a single session. For all your talk about what a lesser gun this is, this thing isn't half bad. Until this point in the game, players have only seen headcrabs attached to the heads of zombies. This led playtesters familiar with headcrabs from prior games to anticipate encountering them on their own. We decided to play up this anticipation by foreshadowing the first headcrab encounter with a headcrab that drops out of a vent before disappearing, as well as headcrab sounds in the environment, including a threatening headcrab sound coming from the partially boarded up doorway ahead. Heard anything about Dad, Russell? No. Radio silence since he got on the train. Damn it. Well, the good news is he's probably fine. How do you know that? Because they're taking him to Nova Prospect to torture him. That's the torture place. So they're hardly gonna torture him before they get there. So he's fine. Logically speaking.
there is a floppy disk. We used to store information on them with magnets, if you can believe it. Huh. Specifically, two micrometers magnetic iron oxide, three micrometers barium ferrite, a 1.2. To wrestle? How do you know all this? I'm reading it here on my computer. I downloaded the internet before the war. You downloaded the entire internet? Yeah, most of it. Nice. Yeah, yeah, it is. There are two layers to the markings on the walls in this area. The square and dot patterns, that are the functional elements of the environmental puzzle, and the mural representing the Vortigaunt's interpretation of the events of the Half-Life Saga. For the first few years of development, this area only contained the dot patterns supporting the perspective puzzle. But as we fleshed out the rest of the level, we found that playtesters responded especially positively to the Vortigaunt's wall markings leading up to the hideout. It was at this point that we realized that this area could serve as a canvas for our Vortigaunt's artistic magnum opus. To do this, we organized the dot patterns into a sort of swirling star field behind the Vortigaunt's art. The imagery itself, which was inspired by petroglyphs and other traditional rock art, portrays many significant events from the Combine invasion, painted hurriedly by the injured Vortigaunt, almost as if he was trying to capture what fleeting memories he still had of the Vortessence from which he had been severed. The fact that Vortigaunts have a complicated relationship with time gave us a lot of leeway in terms of drawing this as a strict, linear timeline. For example, you may notice that the Vortigaunt uses contemporary Combine troops as shorthand for Combine invasions from the past, or that the timeline is just generally hazy. A little from the past, a little from the present, and a little looking forward to the future events of Half-Life 2. There are many musical themes and motifs used throughout the game to represent unspoken aspects of the story and lore. For example, the well, Vortigaunts play an well integral role in the subplot of the game, and we chose to use music to subconsciously communicate the repeating nature of their role both in the timeline of Half-Life Alex and in the larger timeline of the Half-Life Saga. Within the music in this scene, you'll hear variations of themes used throughout the timeline of the game from the very first sounds of the game up to the finale in the vault. Variations of these motifs represent the imprisoned chanting of the Vortigaunts, the extraction of their energy to confine the G-Man, as well as historically familiar sounds representing the Vortessence itself.
is weird. During our earliest attempts to raid Alex, our instinct was to have her react to absolutely everything. But what we learned from playtesting was that Alex reacting too much could actually be off-putting. Say a player is in a really tense zombie-filled level, and they're having a great time, but suddenly Alex is in their head, sounding angry, or frightened, or anxious. These Alex reactions were creating a disconnect between how the player was feeling and how the character they were role-playing as was feeling. So we took a lot of those out. The Alex reactions we left in tended to be the ones that were practically oh. universal. Hey. Alex's reaction Alex here died. to the surreal entrance to the Vort hideout is a good example, mm. where it was just so different from everything the player had seen up until then and kind of takes you by surprise. We watched so many playtests where the player would see it and say, whoa, okay. that's weird. Thanks. So we had Alex say the same thing a second later, almost like an echo. So what's a Vortigaunt doing here? <laughs> Right, but I mean, in general. I have a brain injury. Oh, I'm sorry to... My brain is injured. That's terrible, oh. and I hope... Look, I'm actually pretty busy looking for my father. The... Eli Eli Vance. Yes. The Combine have him, and I really do need to get moving. The Combine. Yes. Do not go yet. I will show you something. For as long as we've been making choreographed scenes like this one, we found that there are two types of players. Those who become engrossed with the characters, and those who tinker with everything around them, paying little attention to the scene's action. To make these environments entertaining for the tinkerers, we usually add objects for them to find and play with. Since this scene is split into two rooms, we were able to add a large number of interactions to this first room, for players to discover after the Vortigaunt has moved to the second room. Some interactive objects are pure physically driven toys, like the dangling headcrab corpses and the hanging pans. Others are animations triggered by the player's actions, like the way the caged headcrabs react to the player approaching or shooting them. One type of object on the table is a squeezable headcrab heart which is a remnant from an older version of this scene where the player would revive a wounded Vortigaunt by squeezing nectar from these hearts. While that scene didn't work out, we found the experience too compelling and, well, too gross to completely cut from the game. Enter. fundamental challenge of any choreographed dramatic scene like this one is making sure that we entertain the player without undermining the delivery of critical gameplay information. In this case, the player needed to leave this scene with the knowledge that the Vortigons have been imprisoned and that the player should seek the Northern Star. This particular scene went through many different variations during development, from a cooking scene with an extremely traumatized Vortigon to this humorous version. We even experimented with an interaction where the player was really required to squeeze the nectar of several headcrab hearts into the Vortigaunt's mouth to revive him. While this was a memorable and novel VR interaction that ensured the player was engaged with the scene, the interactivity on the player's part often resulted in playtesters remembering the actions they took, but not the critical gameplay information. Eventually, we ended up with this more humorous scene, which struck an effective balance between entertainment and I goal really delivery. Go. And I'm Importantly, sorry, really we also distributed the scene across no, no. two separate rooms, breaking the information no, delivery yeah. into two steps. The first room where the player meets and learns about the state of the Vortigaunt, and the second room where the player is given their new goal. Separating these physically into rooms seemed to help players more reliably retain the critical information friends, delivered in I the second room. While this scene did undergo a lot of changes, one story beat remained I virtually unchanged from the very first roughed-in version. The moment the Vortigaunt tosses a headcrab carcass down to the player and yells, Sustenance! Right from the start. This moment always got a great reaction from playtesters and remained all the way to the final product. Uh. 
I will help the Alex Lands. Look to the Northern Star. Why? For guidance. Okay, thanks. Are you done helping? I am not. Here. Sustenance. Uh, I'll eat it later. Thanks for the help. You will be welcome. 